and we're live. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another another live stream on the narrative. Myself, malfunction here in Fungaray. It's been a kind of a dreary day. It rained, um, but you take what you t get because sometimes you know you, the plants got to grow, and you can't always have a sunny day. And um, I like to. Um, I mean, as you guys know, I've, I've, I've saying that we're going to have this amazing, uh, amazing discussion, but also with an amazing person that I've, I've known for about two years on and off. I've only ever talked to her twice in person, if I remember right. Uh, and uh, the first time was uh, with uh, suicide prevention, uh, with a um, with a hip hop um, concert here in uh, at one one six, where we're going to have our plunge event. Uh, but also. Uh, just in passing, I think it was last year at the chemist and just saying, when I was a little boy, uh, I remember my mom going, taking me up to this kid's place who had been bullying me and basically went to the door, knocked on the door and said, don't you dare, your son did this and this and I don't want to see it happen again. And mom basically took, you know, right up to the guy's house and I saw this big burly guy there going, looking at his boy going, basically ashamed that I walked mother had to come and tell him off at his door and I, I thought you know that's something that um i think um mums are really connected to their sons with and i think uh it's it's that parent um, parent thing with um sons and mums but also there's a fathers and daughters thing and i think uh there's a difference that we got to really think about when we when we when we think about parenting and stuff but aside from that so that was the last conversation I had with Trent. Uh, but the other thing was that this week um, I saw her do a live stream video about something that happened 16 years ago with her. And I loved the way that she talked about it. And I, I was watching the whole live stream. I caught the, you know, I came in about two minutes in, but I watched the whole thing. I listened to it. Um, and it was really, uh, really amazing to hear the way she told it. And not in the sense that it was a story or something, but uh, the clarity I heard, and I, and I tweeted to, um, I uh, commented on it saying, "Hey, I would love to have you come on the show." And um, then she said, "Dear me," and here we are. So, Trins, take it away, Katrina uh, Tipinia, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, kia ora whanau. Uh, my name's Katrina Tipinia. I am a mother of four children. I live in Whangarei, have lived in Whangarei for over 30 years, um, 30, 35 years um, we've lived in Whangarei for. Um, Whangarei's home, my father is Goipa Rudolph and my mother is Patricia Tepanea. So my dad comes from a little place, uh, centre of the universe named Pauringa, and my mother is from uh, Waihapa Oturu um, in the far north in so really, really strong ties to Te Tai Tokiro. Um, so yeah, that, that's who I am and where I hail from. I um, I smiled because of Pauranga because when I was uh, when I was at art school, um, we actually went um, at here at North Tech. It wasn't called North Tech then; it was called Northern Polytechnic. Um, we went up, and I think it was in a second year, and built a statue up at Pauranga Marae. Um, oh, okay. As part of our uh, our art, you know, um, thing, we used to go up there uh, for about two weeks. Uh, I think it was a week or two weeks. We stayed there uh, with the whole art, um, you know, different art um, faculties. So there was like uh, the Maori design, uh, the craft design, and sculpture, and also the uh, I think it was two D and three D media. And so we ended up going up and putting up a metal um, sculpture of a bird. Um, I can't remember if it was Riri and uh, Rewa, uh, with the names of it, but we basically, you know, built these um, very large, uh, I think it was about six foot, with the wingspan of about maybe eight foot metal, you know, sculpture. And so that's, I've been up there twice, and I really love that area. It's quite a nice area, going, um, going up the golden um, golden stairs, or steps. Yeah. 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 And it's, Yes. You're lucky because um, not a lot of people actually know of that area. And so my dad, um, he was the co-martyr for North Tech. He was okay. the cultural cultural advisor. And mm. so he was um, part of that. So you, you would have actually known my dad. He was one of the organisers um, for that. And that bird there um, carried 
Ray Tu and Ray Pai. Um, and so there was a chief named Uionioni, and he went down to the Waikato to find him a wife. And he went down on a bird and he picked these two sisters, Ray Tu and Ray Pai. And um, they stopped in um, Whangarei. Uh, because one of the sisters needed to go to the um, to the toilet, and uh, the other sister wanted Uionioni all to herself, so she said that the other um, sister wasn't coming back and that they should leave. So um, she left, and that's how Farangarei got their name. Was um, was it Reitu or Reipai? I think it was um, Reipai. She um, was walking along the beach and she met um, Tahu Portiki, mm. who, uh, and they, they were the, that's a local chief from, from Whangarei. And so that bird that, um, that you guys did the sculpture of was the bird that brought Uionioni and um, Reitu back to um, Hawaringa. And that's where they lived. And one of them are buried there. Um, uh, in Pauringa. Nobody knows where they're buried, though. Um, they've always tried to find out where they're buried. And But, yeah, um, it's it's a beautiful place. It's, mm. it's home. And yeah. It's I, good. The area is amazing. I mean, like, when you actually go up to um, up to the uh, Golden Steps, I mean, we, I've been up there, I think, maybe two times or three times up there in that time. And you just look out. And I think, is that the West Coast or is it the East Coast? That's, uh, um, so Te Rarua is on the West. So that's um, the, um, the Tasman Sea. So, yeah, so Whanga Pier, which is just across the harbour from um, Hauringa, mm -hmm. um, just, uh, you go through the harbour and then it just opens out into the um, ocean, out to the um, Tasman Sea. It's, uh, I mean... It's such a beautiful area. I think a lot of people uh, um, probably miss out by not going there. And Kataya itself is an amazing area. You know, uh, I've, I've got family members, um, extended family members that actually live in Kataya. So when I was a kid, I used to hitchhike to Kataya or go up in the car and then hitchhike back. And you get to see yeah. all the, um, like the, the coast on the west side, I guess. Yeah, I always get mixed up with my east and west. Um, but, you know, um, Taipa and all that, Golden Bay, it's yeah. just... Yeah, east, east Coast, that, that's on the East Coast, that is. And um, that's a beautiful drive out that way. The roads, everything about the East Coast um, uh, is beautiful. And then you go out the West Coast and the roads are really rough and really rocky, but yeah. the scenery is absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. You'll never, ever get um, places like, the places that we have up, up home and the scenery and, and untouched, pristine yeah. land, you know, Māori owned too, you know. Uh, mm. that, that's the best thing about home is that it, it belongs to us. Yeah. You know, they nobody can take that away from us. Is, you know, we, we, we get to return. It belongs to us, the people, you know. And, and I think that's the beauty of... Um putting your feet down somewhere that you're a part of. I mean, I remember every time I go to Fiji, I kind of feel like I'm part of there, but I call New Zealand home. And uh, as soon as I get there, I go, I can't wait till I get back home. <laughs> because it's, you know, when you've been, you know, when you live somewhere for almost 40 years, you kind of, you know, it's part of you. And I mean, like, as we we're talking just before, I, you know, having gone to school in, um, in Kayo and, uh, you know, in, um, what well, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, for two years of my childhood, and it's like, you know, the other thing is that, um, by doing that, I got to be part of a lot of, um, well, not a lot, about three or four Marais in that area in the east coast, and because you know, because of being part of the, um, uh, you know, like we're talking about the, uh, the fire that we had teaching us, we go to before it was called Kapahaka. Way before, this is like in the 80s, 84, 83, before it was called Kapahaka. You know, I was the only kid who was doing it. And, uh, you know, because we had to do it. And it was, but it was the beauty of being part of that. And we'd go up to Taipa at, um, I think it was the college up there. And we had a competition one time and I had to give a speech in Maori. And at that, as a kid, I could actually speak pretty well. Now I can't even 
remember, you know, I introduced myself, but uh, I could actually get up there and do a, you know, do a speech of Maori and get up there and do that and not feel uh, scared or anything because we practice and I knew all my friends were behind me and we get up there with about 20 people on the stage and then you do your thing and everybody would go like, who's that? Because I was the darkest <laughs> kid there, right? I was the darkest yeah. one there. They were like, you know, and then it didn't really matter at that point. But then I remember coming back to public school in Moro, um, um, Oteria, and it was like, you were just like another number and nobody really had so much to do with Maori culture. And it was really weird because um, there wasn't as much time spent on that back in, um, in the Bay of Islands as it was in, at, um, at Kaio boarding school up there at St. Joseph's. Uh, I think I missed that. And I think, um, I, I don't know where life would have been if I was still there going through that, but it was only till about stand, uh, form two anyway. Um, so I think the great thing about us in Northland is how close knit we are and how quickly we can get to places like these beautiful places. You can yeah. just jump in the car and half an, half an hour you're at the beach, you know, yeah. and half, um, 45 minutes you're home. You know, if yeah. you're, if you're, you know, for me, if it's homes in Moira, so 45 minutes at home, it's home. Yeah. Um, or two hours. Whereas if you look at living overseas, so like somewhere in America, you like, you probably never leave your area, you know, and, you know, because you, um, you base, your state is your area and, you know, and you never see anything else. But we, we, we're quite blessed and, uh, I think privileged as well because of yeah. the beautiful nature you talk about that we have, you know, in our areas. Uh, and, I think for me, it's like really uh, when I see like rubbish around and stuff really gets my goat up. It's one thing I really don't like is walking down the street and seeing rubbish, you know, and yeah. going on a beach and seeing people leaving their chocolate wrappers or McDonald's wrappers on the beach. It just feels really wrong because it's like, who did this? Could you not yeah. just pick it and leave, take away, you know, it's that whole thing of like, leave it like you found it. But if you, yeah. if you, if you found it like it was rubbish on there, you, probably leave it put a leave a more, bit more rubbish there the other thing was um recently i saw that uh, there was a buyback of land of a beach here in northland uh i think it was okay. in the paper that people had crowdfunded to buy back so it wouldn't be sold overseas and i'd like to see more of that i think um the power of um not letting um land go overseas and the same thing about fiji um, a lot of land was going overseas, and that's why I think uh, I'm a big, big supporter of Bani Rama because he said, no, no more selling off our lands. Um, because yeah. um, I think once you once you let land go, nobody's going to give it for you the same price that you pay for it. No, no. You know, and the thing is, like, land is um, one of the only things that you can, um, like, Tātaitu, what we call tātaitu, so you can, um, so I can tātaitu pōringa through my dad. Yeah. I can tātaitu waihapa through my mum. Mm. And land is the only thing that we tātaitu. Yeah. So when we say, okay, I can tātaitu pōringa, I can tātaitu, it's the land that we tātaitu, not yeah. a specific building, not, um, you know, yes, our marais and that are there, but they mm. are on the land, and yeah. it's the land that we tātai to. Mm. And so um, for Māori, when we, when we leave this world, we go back to the land, you know, yeah. um, as do most mm. people, you know, get buried. Um, but for us, we go back to our own land. We're not mm. going, like, into a cemetery, like, in, um, you know, uh, in a city. You know, mm. that, that cemetery doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the council. And yeah. whereas Urupa is where we're from, um, uh, on our land. Right. You know, and there's only people in our Urupa that can tātai to that land. Yeah. So you, when we do go, we're surrounded by family, you know. Um, we're not surrounded by strangers or whoever brought the plot next to us, you know. Um and so, yeah, land is the only thing that people can tātai to. And mm. you don't realise how precious land is until it's gone. Exactly. Until it's uh, gone, you know. Yeah. And so my, my husband's from the Waikato, and he's um, 
their land down there is uh, very different to ours. Uh, we have a lot of hills, mm. big mountains and, you know, beautiful um, lots of trees, but their land is more um, hills, um, grassy hills, not a lot of trees, um, but big, wide areas where ours are real hilly and lots of mountains and lots of trees and, you know, the forest, um, the nahiri, you know. So, um, but their land down there is um, very good for uh, farming, um, mm. for growing trees, for leasing the land, their land and, and things like that out to other farmers to use. Um, golf courses, uh, those are the, you know, their land is very different to ours, the, mm. the shape and everything. And so our land really is good for, like, hunting and, mm. um, you know, the the bush, you know, the nahiri, which is able to, you know, uh, provide rongoa for us and trees and fishing and, you know, whereas my husband's land is inland. Yeah. So we're right by the beach, so we can, you know, we've got the beauty of being able to be sustainable, yeah. you know. Um, but their sustainability is different because it's um, uh, their their land is um, a lot flatter, and so mm. they can use it to to do milking and to make farms and to put golf courses on, and so the yeah. sustainability is very different. You know, they would make money off their land. Yeah. Where we would make money off our land through um, providing food for our, our our families, sustainability, being able to, you know, um, so we, we could live in Pauringa off the land. Whereas yeah. my husband, where he is, not they can't live off the, the land. They mm. can live off the money that they lease the land out for, which yeah. is very different, eh, you know, but the sustainability is two very very different but um either way it still belongs to them and that's yeah. what i said to, i said to him you know you're very very lucky that you guys have so much beautiful land as well and then when he came to uh, my father's tangi and he, first time going back to where i'm from uh Pauringa, he he was just blown away he was out the window like a little kid yeah, he was just like, "Wow, this is like, uh, this is where you're from," and I'm like, "Yeah, you know, when you're from there, it's like, it's just, it's home. When you've seen it once, you've seen it a million times. You know, for us, it's just like, then yeah, it's just home. But when yeah. you take people who have never been there before, um, and know the value of land, yeah, um, they really appreciate it, you know. And so, h him and his fa his father came up. My father in law came up as well. And he also said to me, you know, man, girl, you you guys have a beautiful home here. And, and mm. I'm like, yeah, actually we do. And you just don't realize it until you have people from who have never been there before yeah. come and see it, how beautiful for what it is, and, you know, tell you. And you tend to forget that sometimes, you know, just yeah. how lucky we are. Yeah, that's what, that's what really uh, frustrates me sometimes when people don't realize the beauty of what we have in Northland. Uh, yeah. You know, with the the wider community, the groups um, that um, that are there, um, the mate, um, just it's just yeah, uh, it's amazing. Um, you know, like I said, like thirty minutes and you get to the beach here in front of it, and people don't, you know, they could overseas, they could be driving for hours to get to their beach, and like you're saying with your um, with your husband partner, that you know, inland when you're inland. Mm. You know, you're stuck. You don't really, you can't yeah. really go and fish for food. Yeah. You know, you got to go to the yeah. shop and buy it. Um, yes. And yeah. My my parents, uh, my mum, my mum's side of the family in Fiji, um, almost probably about maybe 110 years ago or something like that. Uh, after you know, because we're gourmets, uh, um, denture labourers, and denture labourers, um, and so one day I think one of the um, whoever came up to him. Um, uh, I think it might have been a, um, I, I don't know, my granddad anyway, my granddad's granddad, basically said, this is your, you know, land, this is this is yours, you need to cultivate it, uh, farm it, but this is yours, right, and this is what you, your, whatever you worked for, and um, and so 
it's been in, in the family for over 100 years now, I think. I think last time I thought about it was about 10 years ago. And even though, you know, Mum's um, been here forever, we just did a 40-year anniversary for her for being a New Zealand citizen and so on. And then she's got a 40-year wedding anniversary coming up this year as well. And I think two weeks ago, we celebrated her 40 years uh, as a citizen as well as a, uh, as a Kiwi, I guess. And she's, she's that land, she's got a plot there in Fiji. And um, and it looks over this beautiful um, area in Sansali, which is uh, which used to be used to be a beach. Now it's a resort, and um, so you can't fish. You know you can't fish, and the only fish you can get is about this big, <laughs> and uh, and because the tourists, uh, whoever's going up to the um, hotel, or whatever a resort that's there, they take them out just outside to fish all for the all the big fish. So the only fish that comes in is the little fish. And so when I remember when I was a kid, when granddad used to go, we used to get like half a meter long, 50 meter, you know, 50 centimeter long fishes and, get, uh, you know, everything. And, um, and now it's like, well, it looks like it's just empty because of the clearing they had to put in the wharf uh, and so on to get, get across to this, um, um, this uh, resort. And um, so the whole area looks a bit more thing, but also the, the weird thing is across from that area is our family plot for the whole village is the cemetery. So you got the you've got um, the Fijians have their own uh, because in the village, you know they have their um, their uh, burial grounds in their village, but the Indians and the Muslims they have it on the beach, and so they because they burn right, uh, Indians burn their um, burn their dead. So, and then that then that gets washed out into the ocean, and so on the ashes. So it's weird having grown up with that there on the beach, and then looking out and seeing a resort on the other side. It's like I don't know how people feel, what tourists feel when they go in. It's like there's dead people here, and but we're going to the holiday, and it's just yeah. But the other thing is like um, it's the beauty of having something you can put your feet back down is something that I think a lot of people don't really understand as you're saying that you can actually put your roots down we talk about roots and where you come from and uh, I learned that like we were talking about being a kid you know uh, 10 years 11 years old uh, uh, from my fire back in uh, you know Kayo um, at the school talking about how you introduce yourself I'm so and so my mum is so and so my dad so and so uh, this is my mountain this is my hill this is my marae you know, this yeah. is my land that I come from. And that yeah. sort of has always been in my head because, you know, when you, you kind of go, well, where do you really come from? And a lot of us, I know, especially because I've lived in, um, I lived in um, probably about 10 years of my life over a couple of different years, periods amongst suburban Maoris in Auckland uh, and Pākehā and Tokelauans and Rarotongans. And, uh, you know, young people my own age, back then, 20 years, 20, 18, 19 year olds, and you kind of see them floundering. I mean, I floundered for a long time. I still flounder now, but about where you come from, what your identity is, and, uh, and where you fit into this uh, modern world. And I think a lot of our youth have, don't have that, this is me, this is my mom, this is my dad, this is my mountain, this is my marae, and this is my land where I come from. And I think, that kind of um, adds to what we're going to talk about next, which yeah. is um, yeah. uh, suicide prevention. And um, I know we did a long in introduction, but I think that's very important to actually understand why we actually end up with so many people um, having a loss of identity and uh, a base. Uh, I I a connection so they they lose their connection with who they are and yep. um that that sense of identity and belonging is um is something that especially us as maori um you know being able to identify um that you know i'm a maori my mum was a maori my dad was a maori their parents were maori their parents and being able to identify mm. as um who you are who you are first is your we're maori mm. you know what i mean that's 
that's who we are. We we are Māori. Like I said, my dad was Māori, my mum was Māori. Their parents were Māori, their parents were Māori. And so when, when we say to identify with yourselves, it's to identify with who you are. You know, okay, you know, my name's Katrina, but really who I am is I am Māori. And, um, you know, I'm going to go, like, right into it, exactly how I see it. This is my perception and my, through my experiences and through the mahi and work that I do with suicide prevention and awareness. So through colonisation, we have lost a lot of who we are through colonisation. We have um, been urbanised. So what that means is we were brought from our lands and brought into the city to build a lot of these, um, a lot of uh, whangarei. And whangarei were built by our, our Māori um, families. They were brought in to, like, pretty much slavery. It wasn't slavery, but it was like they were brought in from out in the country and brought into the um, cities to build these cities yeah. or to build whangarei. So the families in that that um, pretty much did the building ground for whangarei, a lot of that family live in Mangakahia, mm. um, Mangakatamia, Mang, Mangakatamia, and um, that, that they claim that, you know, our forefathers were the ones that built these cities. Mm. And they were. A lot of our Māori men were taken from you know, the um, from their homes and put into cities, Auckland, mm. Whangarei, you know, and um, for work, chasing that dream of um, being able to buy your own home, you know, they were given this big dream that, you know, mm. mate, you come to the city, we will, you know, you can work and make a living and build your home and everything else like that. But they went there, they worked, but then they also got caught up in the um, the alcohol, you know. Yeah. Alcohol was a big thing for, like, my dad's era, you mm. know. Um, they become unemployable mm. because they'd never – they come from a little town in the country that had no alcohol, no mm. – you know, um, they went to church every single Sunday. They they cut a care. If they prayed every mm. single day, morning and night. Mm. You know, church on a Sunday. That's the lifestyle that my dad grew up in. Same as my mum. Mm. They all grew up in convents and went to church and prayed. And so um, that was very very staunch for them. But then mm. when they were taken out of the country and put into the cities, they were then colonized mm. because then they started to become um, part of the system you know because living in the country they they weren't they, they lived their life you know they lived a totally different lifestyle to what they were living in the cities and so as soon as they got around all the um, the temptations, Mm. It was just far too too much temptation. You see a lot of it with the um, the island, a lot of the uh, Pacific Island um, nations that come here. They yep. come here and they get the alcohol and like they they just go off their rail because they've never had that. They've never been allowed that in their country, you know. But mm. then they come here and oh. Woo -woo, it's a whole different lifestyle, you know, for them. A huge lifestyle change. But um, alcohol is a big, huge thing for our Pacific Island um, countries and that, you know, mm. when, they, when they come here. Um, but, um, you know, for me, it's the colonizations are part of it, you know. It, it, mm. It's happened, it's it's there, but if you choose to stay a part of that, then, you know, don't moan about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, if, if, you want to run for, if you want to hunt for that dollar, uh, you can't really uh, then say, well, it's your fault. You know, it's, and yeah. I think that's, I think that, um, I mean, 
there's a bit of personal responsibility to our actions. I mean, when you're talking about like Pacific Islands, I mean, I, I remember like uh, payday back in, in Fiji, <laughs> right? Payday back in yep. Fiji, um, granddads, uh, uncles who are older, you know, were, who were over, who are working were allowed to drink, but the others yep. weren't. If you're a teenager, yep. you don't touch that. Uh, I accidentally once did and, you know, I KO'd myself, but then didn't for forever. <laughs> But um, I think um, I remember work, working with the people I just mentioned, people my own age in Auckland. I worked, um, I worked for about three years at a, uh, at a bakery owned by a Bangladeshi uh, family. And they're really good people. And uh, we were teenagers. We we're 16, 17 year olds. They actually be, you know, became adults in that time while working there. So I had, um, I had a Pakia friend next to me. I had a Maori um, young girl next to me, and I had a Rarotonga friend next to me. You know, in this mm. one place, and we and we'd get our payday in the weekends on Saturdays. We'd just get drunk. Uh, <laughs> that was it. You know, yeah. uh, just just KO, and we, yeah. you know, and then uh, I was uh, I was a bit different because I used to get I was into music and comic books, and um, I'd go spend my money and save the other money for alcohol. Right, so we run around our skateboards as 18, 70 year old kids, um, nine year olds, and uh, all weekend drinking, uh, buying beer. Uh, if, if we weren't able to afford it, we just, uh, I remember taking some out of my uncle's cup, uh, fridge and leaving, you know, 20 bucks there. Yeah. And so <laughs> and he gets home, goes, he gets pissed off because uh, I, took, I took the beer and he's came home after work to drink it and wasn't there. But he got the money, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, it's you know, and then imagine that doing that for the next twenty years of your life, and but the other thing is then watching your when you have children growing up with that as well, and then yes. you're going to say, well, you should That's be drinking. Generational, yeah, yeah, you shouldn't be drinking, yeah. but it's like, well, you did it, and now that you're showing that, and um, I think that whole generational thing really um, it's hurting. It's hurting our young yeah. young people, and well, I've watched. You know, you know. Co co colonization and urbanization is the um, like bottom line stuff. You know, mm. if we start working from the bottom upwards, um, mm. you then start to have um, racism. You know, um, going through school, and you know, we were sort of um, the the system. We failed. You know, a lot of our um, children or a lot of our us kids fell through the system. You yeah. know, fell fell through the schooling system. You know, we we managed majority of us managed to get jobs. You know, because um, we we're going to do what we have to do to be able to provide for our families. You know, yeah. um, but there are ones like I met a sixth generation um, beneficiary sixth generation that i was just blown away by that i was just like are you kidding me i couldn't i couldn't get over it and so he explained it to me and, and i was just like mate that's uh, it's not something to be proud of you yeah, know I for me um, i i feel you know i feel aroha for you because of that because yeah. you've been exposed to it your mother was exposed to it her mother was exposed to it and um it was just that if that's all you know, if you are only brought up in a home where all you know is just to live week to week and be on a benefit and have children and get more money and, you know, and rely on the system, that is a, a, another one. It's another mm. system that you fall into. But that's all you know. How mm. is that child meant to know any better if that's all he knows? I call it a caste system here in New Zealand. It's a caste yeah, system. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I'm sure you understand about the, um, the caste system of, of India where I come from the lowest yes. caste. The lowest yeah. caste. Yes. As far as I know, I am, our family comes from the lowest caste. And you were talking about how earlier about um, leaving your, uh, your land and having to go to be urbanized and work yeah. because you're in betterment. That was the same thing with our family. Well, most of us, 99% um, of, of people that came from India or other places, Fiji as Indians and uh, as uh, 
and different cultures, there's different ethnicities in Fiji, uh, uh, Arabian, as, um, Arabic as well, uh, from the Middle East. Uh, it was because of work, to better yourself, to get yeah. out of the caste system, to not be raised in the lowest of the bottom of the of your people, of your ethnic, yeah. ethnic uh, country. Yeah. And they chose horrendous sometimes to be able to go through, to get to where we are, to be able to then again, you know, make a better life for yourself. And uh, I was thinking about this a couple of weeks ago, and I mentioned this on here with um, on another cast. Uh, the, I see, I see benef beneficiary uh, the benefit in social welfare similar to caste system because, like you said, six six generations. That's that's horrendous because it means yeah. that you've had to live on the lowest amount of money you could yeah. for six generations, and not yeah. only that, now you're showing. You probably that sixth generation person will do the same thing, and yeah. what about the rest? And they'll be saying, "Well, this is how you live by getting this little amount of money from the government, and uh, you know they'll top you up every couple of years, give you a little bit more, or yeah. you know at winter they'll give you a bit more, and you're like you're happy with that, you're really happy <laughs> with that, and you don't want to get out of it because it's you don't have to work, you don't have to better yeah. yourself because it's hard work to better yourself, but yeah, and that's but, um, tokenism." Tokenism, yeah. so I've, I've learnt what tokenism is just recently in the last two to three months. Um, and so, so tokenism is something where um, the government gives them, like you said, gives them a little bit of money over winter and um, people feel like, oh, we, we've got something. Oh, that, you know, they've done us a favour. Yeah. But really, they haven't. You know, they the, bought the vote, basically. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, and they haven't done them any favors because they didn't work for it. Yeah. You know, so th um, they've done nothing more, but mm. yet they've gotten something for nothing. So yeah. it really isn't helping anyone when you just give them things like that. It's, it's tokenism. So um, it's a bit like over the COVID, you know. Um, so my dad passed away at uh, level two, okay. and th that was when it went from um, 10 people at a funeral to 50. Yeah. You know, but 100 people could go to the pub, and that is exactly what tokenism is. They gave us 50 yeah. for funerals and tangihanga, yeah. you know, um, but they gave the pubs and restaurants 100. So for us, it was like, you guys, here, we'll give you 50 now, you know. Be grateful. Be thankful we've given you something. And, and that's basically but it. then 100 mm. could go to the pub or mm. to the restaurant. And so that is, like, for me, the easiest way to be able to explain what tokenism is. Just give you enough. when it happened, time. I was like, mm. everybody was like, yay, we're going to have 50 people now. And I'm just like. That's just tokenism, you know, and they were like, oh, what's that? And then I explained it to them, and they are like, oh, but we're grateful. And I go, yes, that's exactly how they want you to feel. Yeah. That's exactly what they want you to feel, is um, to feel grateful that, oh, you got 50 and, and not 10. Yeah. But why didn't we get 100? And, you know, why was it only 50? And so, yeah, to tokenism mm. is, is something that – um. I explain to a lot of people and I use that word a lot as well in, mm. in some of my kōrero. Um, Backpedal a little bit more. So groundwork, you know, you've got your colonisation and, mm. and um, your race, urbanisation, and then, you know, you've got your racism, um, failing in school, mm. um, you know, working, but working pretty much anything and everything that we possibly could just get. You know, um, whatever we could get. Um, but it takes, like, for me, I, it wasn't until late in my father's life that he started to work. Yeah. You know, he worked, um, he was he was a beneficiary. He worked when we were young, and then they went through a sort of a phase as, because there were seven of us. Mm -hmm. So, that, mm -hmm. you know, it got harder and harder for my mum and dad to have to provide um, yeah. as our, you know, as the children the amount of children increased. Mm. And so um, it got harder and harder. And then 
there was a lot of times where there was no work, you know, where they, they couldn't get work. And, you know, so they went to the benefit. Yeah. But once we grew up and we all moved out and we started working, my dad went back to work. Hmm. And when he went back to work, he was a cultural advisor. He worked for ACC. He worked for the hospital, um, uh, District Whangarei District Hospital. He worked for the district courthouse, the Whangarei District court, Courthouse, as a cultural advisor. Um, he worked for the council. He worked for ASB, the um, Sport Northland. And um, he also worked for North Tech. So he, he was the longest standing member on the staff at North Tech. So he spent 12 years, hmm. 12 years at North Tech, and he went through six CEOs at North Tech during the 12 years that he was there. So he was the longest standing um, member of the North Tech um, organization. And so, you know, that was a huge thing for us, like, you know, something for us to be be proud of. I'm proud of it, you know. And um, so we, we had good roots. Mm. You know, we, we had good roots. When we talk about roots, you know, like where I come from, yeah. strong connection with home, you know, strong connection with my mum and my dad, mm. um, very spiritual, you yeah. know, um, because my dad was Catholic and he he was very, very staunch in his um, Catholic, um, Catholic, you know, um, his, his religion. Very, very staunch, but it made him very, very spiritual. Yeah. So through through his prayers, he was able to do things that a lot of people would only dream of being able to do, mm. you know, through the power of prayer. Yeah. And so for my dad, his religion is what – what because he didn't – um get his real his uh until quite late in his life yeah. in his maybe 40s um and then one, once he found his real he also um found his uh his religion again yeah so then he lost it for some time and then when he found it again um he was able to he became very connected Mm. With um with his uh with his real with mm. his um and with his religion as well and so it made him very very spiritual mm. um and so his his spiritual well being was very very um strong and that that is one thing with his corridor about um suicide that I hold very very dearly to when you're young. If you can't become disconnected, so mm. you have your physical being and then you have your spiritual being and the, your inner soul, you know, your inner, well, your, your spiritual being. Mm. There's two sides to you. And so um, if you, when you're young, lose or disconnect from one of those, so... Um, the best way he explained it was um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He took care of his body, and yeah. for years, and his physical well, his physical being was very, very strong. But his spiritual well, his spiritual being wasn't. And then you had the Pope, who was one of the most spiritual beings on this earth. Mm. And his spiritual being is very strong, but his body and his physical appearance isn't. Mm. And so when you have that disconnection from it, so when young people become disconnected from um, their spiritual being as well mm. as their or their physical being, um, also, you know, when you talk about spiritual um, well-being, it's also the mental Mm. Your mental well-being. That's because that's you can't see it, but it's there. Yeah. It's that's there, but you can't about. see it. That's what I was thinking about when you said your dad found it again. And I think the word that came to my mind was clarity. Yeah. That, time, that, that time he uh, in prayer or meditation that some people yeah. like to do, 
uh, that time you take away to actually sit down and think and get some, because a lot of time when you're just busy, 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 you don't have time to think and really focus on yourself and your well-being. Uh, yeah. and, um, and you're sitting there, you're probably going, how do I better myself? How do I better people around me? What can I do? Because you've taken time away to actually think about that and you get a lot of clarity. And uh, I mean, that's why I don't, uh, for myself, um, I have, I have a religious background um, and so I don't poo-poo anybody's religion because of it, because I understand that there are so many good things that you can find in religion or religious uh, teachings uh, because, uh, like you said, it sets you uh, to, uh, you can always go, well, remember that time when I was at Sunday school and they said about this and about that and you learn a little bit of story and you take that with you. I mean, one of the things... um, I brought up the other, um, the other week about when I was in my 20s and um, I think it might have been 25. I did a little painting from, it was from the Psalms, I think it was, or something from Ecclesiastics from King Solomon. And, uh, you know, it was, it was regarded as one of the most uh, wise men I've ever lived. And it, was, it said, you know, um, speak, uh, speak uh, seek justice for those who can't, uh, uh, who don't, uh, um, something like along the lines of seek justice for those who, they, who can't afford it or something. Um, you know, and um, something about helping them, and it's always been in my head. You know, if if you if you find someone who's not able to say what they they can, you try to help them to say it, or you try to get them a voice, you know, or something to say, hey, come on, you can do this. You know, help them along. And I think this is where your work comes in, where you know uh, you sit down with people uh, um, because I, I, you know, like I was saying back in twenties, um, I work. I, for about six years as a, as a youth worker. So it's always uh, something that I hold dear to. And I always think about how hard it is and how difficult it was for me and for those in my, you know, around me who were trying to work with kids who were coming from very bad situations sometimes. And as well as some kids that weren't, you know, but still hated their parents. You know, you had kids who were like really, really horribly treated, but they loved their parents. And those that weren't treated that bad and hated their parents, um, I think it's um, for us in Northland. I think uh, you know I've watched it for twenty years, and I've, I've, I'm in a, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not an angel. I've never been an angel, and probably never will be. But there's been points where you know I've worked towards it, and I've had my own difficulties in life, and I've always, you know, I'm never uh, not open about my difficulties. Uh, in my own run-ins with suicide. And that's why I always um, think that we, you know, you can I, you can talk about it, talk about it, talk about it all the times, but there's work to be done. And I think yeah. um, with people like yourself and there's so many other groups locally have all these, uh, I guess they have money thrown at them, you know, and but they're not aware yeah. of how to yeah. actually connect. You can have thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars sent to the youth workers, but if they don't really love the work or they don't have a connection to the people or they don't even have it in their own, you know, they don't get the clarity themselves or they want, they, they're not going to be able to connect. So how do you kind of do what you do? And, uh, you know, because it's a different, very, very, very different thing what you do compared to what everybody yeah. else is doing. And yeah. I've really noticed yeah. that. So tell uh, us about yeah, we, we We do, um, the way that I mahi and the way that I work is um, very um, innovative, I should say. Very, very I, I don't, I think outside of the box. I don't like to be a tick the box person. Mm. I never have been. You know, um, I I work and I I'm there for the people. You know, I'm not there representing an um, you know a, a government organization or anything like that. I'm there to represent the people. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't go out and look for people. I don't go out there and go, hey, do you you know do you know anybody that needs any help? Or mm-hmm. I, I, they come to me. And that, that's the thing, like, I don't have to have bums on seat, mm. you know, for my funding or anything like that. And I'm a true believer of um, it's not how much money you get, it's about what you do with it that yeah. makes the difference. 
Yeah. You can get a million dollars thrown at an organization that goes in and spends it on houses for themselves. Mm. It's not about the money. It's about what they do with it that makes the difference. Yeah. You know, and sets us apart. What sets me apart from all the other organizations is I don't get paid. <laughs> mm. I'm, I don't do my suicide prevention. I'm not, I'm not paid. It's not a paid job. Mm. I don't, it's not a hobby for me. It's mm. just something that I connect really well with people about. I'm very empathetic. Mm. I'm very compassionate. And I'm, I feel, literally feel their pain. So when someone comes to me or reaches out to me um, and we connect and I know that I've connected with them in a way where I'm like, okay, you know, I know I can help this young lady. Mm. I understand with the prevention, the, the work that I've been doing over the years, one of the things that I've come to understand is mm. that when I first started, I wanted to save everybody. I was like, my project is going to save everybody. Yeah. And so, um, well, it was a real wake-up call for me when that year 667 people took their lives. Yeah. You know, um, I was just like, oh, my God, it was a record high, yeah. you know, that year. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, my God. It's, I started to backpedal and I started to think to myself, um, this isn't even working. You know, what I'm doing isn't even saving lives. And, oh, you know, and I really started to backpedal and think about um, whether or not I wanted to continue doing the work that I was doing, whether, whether or not what I was doing was making a difference. Mm. And so um, I, yeah, I, I come to realise that I can't save everyone. Yeah. But those that I can save, I will endeavour to do so. Yeah, And that is something that I hold really, really closely for me and my suicide prevention is understanding that I can't save everyone. Mm. But those that I can save, I will endeavour to do so. I think um, that's basically uh, like, th that's a mercy thing. I mean, uh, um, an empathy thing that for people, and it's really hard to... To um to tell people that are in that situ you know that in that mindset or that Iowa that you you can't you can't do everything you know and I think uh, we're a bit stalled there with um hold on um with Kat would we'll um get her to um, log out and log back in let me just try that Sorry about that, guys. Uh, we'll be back in a sec. This is when I need a producer <laughs> to be sitting here with me uh, and um, sorting these technical things out. All right, so... Um, as I was, um, sorry guys, we just lost Kat. Hopefully she'll be back in uh, with um, Trent. Um, so as I was saying, it's um, when people have a lot of mercy uh, and you know there's different types of people um, and you can tell them their characters and emotions and uh, and you know how they like. And you, you know people around you that are very empathetic. And, um, and we'll have Kat back on as soon as she's able to. And... Um, and it's hard to tell people who are very empathetic to listen. You can't save everyone. Uh, you you need to basically uh, understand how things um, that not everybody wants you to save them. And you got to find who you can work with. And as Kat was saying, that you know she had to step back and realize who she could work with. And um, it's I think. That comes with experience, and I think um, if you want to get into youth work, um, it's very, it's, you have to understand that not everybody is going to appreciate what you do. Not every child or every adult, for that matter, wants your help. And um, you have to find those who are open to your help and that you can help. Um, now, 
think one of the things I think we miss out on um, is um, is you know we, we we get sidetracked by things that are happening around us sometimes, and we we'll get too busy, and we don't have to we're not able to take time out to um, think through things, and um, you know, and um, and um, and and really, really, I, I really think it's important to at least take half an hour of your day after you know after you've done your work or something or even in the morning uh or even 10 minutes it doesn't really have to be that much at least just even the sh jump in the shower you know when you have a shower just think through your day you know uh what is going on in your head what's going on in your family's life uh children's life uh you know calm yourself down is what i think i'm trying to say is calm when you're in that position calm yourself down take the time in the shower to just really uh let let the water wash away and think through uh when you get out there go how am i gonna i might have had a bad day i might have had you know had a horrible day at work somebody said something to me customer was really bad or whatever or you know even when you left a home as a kid you know mom said something bad and you were upset and you come home jump in the shower you know or, or go sit somewhere else uh, um, you know somewhere under a tree or something it's just Take some time out to really calm your nerves, as they say, you know, and think about that. Um, and um, figure out what you want the next few hours to be like. And it's important to to really think about, uh, think things through before you approach situations. And I had to learn that myself that, um, um, you know, two years ago uh, that, um, that, you know, you're always going to have some dark situations in life. And you need to be able to know how to deal with them way before getting to them. Um, so when you when you can take that time out and think about that, then you're able to really um, um, have a, you know have a good focus on what you're doing, and you get a lot of you end up getting a lot of um, benefit for yourself out of it, and you also people around you, your family members, and so on, will also get. Um, will get a lot out of your uh, input in their lives and then more, more understanding. I think a lot of what I'm trying to get to is about being peace at your, with yourself. Uh, it's a, you can, it, things can be really exhausting um, and days can be exhausting. You can have a bad day because it rained bad outside. You can go out and play. So now you're stroppy and you're upset. And then if you pass that stroppiness and upset situation, emotion to somebody else, now they're upset. And now you don't have a good, um, good, um, um, good, you know, um, situation with them. And I think it's important to uh, understand yourself first. And um, you know, and as Trins was saying, uh, where you come from, uh, you know, know, know where your feet's going to stand on, on, you know. Uh, and I think. Um, because I mean, I've lived in Auckland, um, you know, for almost ten years. I think uh, I lived there as a teenager, and I think I turned twenty. So within from about seventeen to um, twenty years old, uh, I think it was just before sixteen. Actually, it might have been just going on to sixteen. I got to see a lot of things happen in Auckland, and um, you know, I actually was beaten up in Auckland as well. And one of the things that has been told was. That uh, if somebody, if, if, if a PI person or anybody came up to you and said, where are you from? You say, you're from Fiji. And they'll say, mm -hmm. I go, yeah, you're, I'm a Fijian. <laughs> and that basically would make them step back and not hassle you. The reason for that is that Fijians have a real, really uh, interesting past in the Pacific Islands. If you want to know more about that, look up, look that up. Now, I'm hoping that um, we didn't lose... Um, Trends for good, uh, maybe um, situation with, uh, with a connection there. Um, hopefully, we might be. Able, I'll cut it off here because I don't want to blabber on too much for tonight. Um, and um, if I can get Trins back on, we'll talk about the actual situation we were going to talk. About, you know, carry on with that discussion. We've got another hour. We're going to uh, we're going to talk about, and uh, hopefully, um, she'll be able to catch back on. But anyway, for tonight, uh, thank you so much, guys, for listening. Um, hopefully, um, you got something out of it. 
Um, that's why we have these interviews and discussions with uh, people locally and overseas. Um, things, are, things are hard, I understand. Um, times are hard, as they say. But all this shall pass too, as they say. This too shall pass. That's the word. This too shall pass. Whatever situation you're going into, tomorrow's a new day. Um, I usually think that um, if you're having a hard time, uh, stressed out or depressed, have a shower and jump, jump in bed. Go to sleep. Um, I find that's the best way to, excuse me, um, to deal with um, things when you, you know, apart from talking out with people. But in the middle of the night, if you're not able to, then if you can't talk to people, then just jump in the shower, have a nice bath or something, bubble bath or whatever, and it doesn't matter. And then just jump in the shower and, um, and go to bed and cover your head, go to sleep up, and then you'll get refreshed, and then you can face a new day and think through what, how you're going to face it. All right. Thank you guys for watching, and kakite uh, We'll see you next time on The Narrative, and uh, thanks for joining me tonight. And hopefully, as I said, we can get our guests back on to finish off our actual discussion. Not sure what happened there, but thank you. If you, before I forget, do my little blurb. If, you, if you're watching this on Facebook, thank you so much. Um, you know, um, welcome to, um, you know, share this. Um, also, um, if you're watching this on YouTube, like, subscribe, as I say, and share it if you want. And we appreciate it. New subscribers, um, because just getting started, I guess, and more the merrier, as I say, and um, hopefully we can keep doing this for a while. Kaki down again and see you guys around.